Well, hey guys, I'm Aaron Lancaster. Hi, Aaron. Hi, Aaron. Hi, Aaron. Hi, Aaron. How are you guys today? Welcome, Aaron. Uh, <laughs> I'm from uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. I work for a company uh, over there. I actually headquartered out of Birmingham, Alabama, called TechLinks, and um, I. I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about uh, some things that we're seeing, uh, trends around crypto malware, specifically with Crypto Locker. Um, so, for those of you who don't know about TechLinks, um, TechLinks is a managed service provider and value added reseller. And um, basically. Microphone. Oh, okay. And I guess I'm supposed to use this microphone. There you go. So, so TechLinks. Uh, Managed service provider, value added reseller, um, but uh, we service a lot of customers, um, small, medium businesses, all the way up to enterprise space, and um, have seen a lot of those folks impacted by Crypto Locker. And so we're going to get a little bit more into that. So, how many of you guys have uh, heard of Crypto Locker before? Maybe it's better to ask who's not heard of Crypto Locker before. It's okay, don't be shy. Um, how many people have actually had Crypto Locker on their machine? Anybody in here? Awesome. Yes. But what, the reverse right. purposes. Come yeah. back around to you uh, a little bit later. Uh, Not my machine, but company machine. Company machine. All right, good. good. What about Tip machines we deliberately you? infected? This is what, happened. <laughs> um, what about machines we deliberately infected? Like? Machines you deliberately infected count. Those, those are in scope for this discussion. counted <laughs> for Awesome. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I just want to, you know, first and foremost, I want to keep this. Uh, someone asked earlier, you know, is this a serious conversation or is, are we going to keep this lighthearted? That was me. Uh, I just want to. Uh, I'd like to keep this conversational, actually. So, and I love stories. I think there's a lot of value in stories, uh, especially in a lot of the work we do. Um, experience is worth a lot, right? So, um, so I want to come back to some of those stories about whether you intentionally or unintentionally infected a machine with crypto locker. But, um, you know, earlier this year, the FBI came out and they said, hey, you know, crypto locker and its variants are a significant threat um, and have been, you know, since September of, uh, of 2012. And, um, you know, it's been actively targeting U.S. victims since April 14. Um, and the financial impact is really high. So we're just making you consumer aware of this, be on your guard, but you know, in true government fashion, um, didn't really give us all that much to go on there about how to guard against this, right? So um, in case uh, you're you know, maybe more or less familiar with what CryptoLocker is, um, you know, CryptoLocker is a ransomware that encrypts your files and holds them for ransom. Plain and simple. So uh, it actually has its own tax, you know, taxonomy, its own category um, called, you know, crypto malware. And um, <clears throat> CryptoLocker really came on the scene in September of 2013. No one really knows how long the development cycle was, you know, prior to that. Uh, how long. Uh, that was brewing before um, the first infections really started. But the earliest recorded in infections of CryptoLocker started around that time. You know, of course, this targets mainly Windows boxes um, and uh, based on everything that uh, we're seeing with the way that this threat's been evolving and advancing and becoming more complex, I personally wouldn't be surprised if um, within a couple of years we don't see this move into the Mac OS X space uh, or even into the Linux space. So um, usually the first thing that people see um, is uh, the ransom note demanding $500 or more in Bitcoin. Um, and it gives you, you know, a timer uh, of 72, 96 hours to pay up the ransom or the keys to your data will be deleted. Uh, theoretically, once you send the payment, it's verified. 
uh, the program will decrypt the files um, that it's already encrypted. Some of the newer threats that are out there, the new version, newer versions that are out there will actually decrypt one file for you for free as a proof of concept to say, yeah, we are actually going to, you know, because what they're trying to prove is the value proposition, right? Like, if I pay you this money, are you actually going to decrypt my, my data, right? So they're trying to prove, yeah, we've got the private key, we'll decrypt it, you know, once you pay us. So the real problem with this comes in where it, this, this malware goes after everything, right? It, it, here's a little quote that talks about, um, you know, technician in the field and what he's experienced, um, you know, with hitting uh, MP3s, Word docs, you know, using a 20, 2048 RSA key, um, and then spreading from, uh, potentially spreading from a home PC to a work network through VPN access. Here's some numbers about uh, CryptoLocker and over the years. So in 2014, CryptoLocker was infecting over 20,000, uh, sorry, 50,000 computers per month at its peak, uh, with over 336 computers in the U.S. alone, which the U.S. is the number one market for crypto locker infections. So this um, relatively targeted attack based on distribution worldwide. And uh, interestingly enough, Google search results um, are well over 210,000 searches per month for um, crypto locker as a term. Yeah. You've said twice that it targets U.S. By what methodology does it do that, and does it really accomplish that? That's a really good question, and um, I think that uh, that's probably mainly based on uh, domain, domain name resolution um, and where the phishing, which is the number one mode of delivery, um, is, you know, dot coms, dot com addresses are being targeted, right? So it's not dot AUs, it's not, you know, dot RDUs, it's not, you know, so those those addresses are going to fall, I think, you know, and that's probably where a lot of that correlation comes from, is from the dot coms. Now, granted, many dot coms fall outside U.S. territory, but by and far, you know, by, by and far, you know, the, most of them are U.S. Uh, names, so um, we'll come back to phishing statistics in a little bit, too and uh, infection vectors. But I think the statistic about the search results for CryptoLocker is really telling because if you think about it, you're not out there doing uh, you know, searches for CryptoLocker on Google um, unless you're a security researcher or you actually have a problem that you're trying to fix, right? Nobody's out there like Googling CryptoLocker just for, to see if they can, you know, um, get crypto locker for example <laughs> you know so the percentage of people who are um, out there looking for information about crypto locker when they don't have a problem associated with that i think statistically is pretty low that's just my opinion um, but also you know this problem around malvertising which is a malicious advertisement that has a javascript or other code embedded in it has uh risen uh 325% in the month of August this year. So, um, you know, that's another part of the problem. And we're gonna get back to malvertisement a little bit more and how it plays, a, it fits into the this this picture as well. That's a pretty cool portmanteau. Did you come up with it or is that What's industry? That? Malvertising. Malvertising, yeah. It's, uh, that's the industry, security okay, cool. industry, yeah. So. <clears throat> So, uh, you know, malvertising is, is kind of leading to this internet pal pandemic, so to speak, where we're seeing 1.3 million uh, malicious ads being viewed every day. The probability of getting infected from malvertisements is twice as likely on a weekend. So, you know, I'm out there surfing the web on the weekend, uh, probably a lot more than I am at work when I'm actually doing work. Um, so it seems like this is, or at least I should be, right? Uh, but it seems like um, it appears that uh, these ads are really targeting um, peak, peak browsing times. 
So where this really comes into impact for companies is that, um, you know, a lot of companies don't host their own content anymore, right? They, they have third party content up there. Just uh, look no further than foxnews.com or cnn.com or msnbc to see an ad frame hosted by a third party site who also hosts ads for yet another party and we kind of get this concatenating or waterfall effect of advertisement material that ends up on a site um, that by itself would be perfectly legitimate, but these advertisements haven't been vetted and they haven't been um, screened. And so uh, now all of a sudden you've got a malicious script on a legitimate site. And so Google started scanning um, a lot of sites and um, you, you may have noticed like in your search results, it says this site may be infected, like underneath the search results. And I don't really have a, uh, I don't think I have a screenshot of this. Actually I do later in my presentation. I just added it in. But uh, Google started scanning for these kinds of scripts, right? And so your, your site, you know, might be like perfectly legit, but then all of a sudden on Google it shows up and says, this site may be a, may contain malicious material. And that's because the Google robots have picked up on the fact that there's some scripts there that um, could cause some harm. Cause some harm. So here's a here's some case study information. So of our you know approximately two to three hundred customers, we're still seeing one per month across the entire customer base over the past year uh, coming down with a crypto locker infection, and. Um, you know, the past calendar year, or, or sorry, past 12 months, that is. And then, so in 2015, we've seen five cases alone. Uh, and health, the healthcare industry comprised about 46% of that, but don't, don't be uh, fooled by this because this approximately reflects an even distribution of the number of companies per vertical that we have. So every industry is seemingly being affected um, uniformly it's not you know the finance industry or manufacturing that's being targeted and I'm going to circle back to why that's important a little bit later because um, uh, well I'll just circle back a little bit later about why that's important so what's motivating these people right what do you guys think it is money money right big so, money big money in this a single instance has made over two hundred fifty thousand um, dollars and over a million dollars um, has been paid out in ransoms. Yeah. Have you seen the statistics on tens of millions reaped from this? Um, so the most the most recent statistics I've seen. Uh, I'm going to get get to that in a couple slides. And um, and these numbers have gone have gone up significantly, and I think they'll continue to go up too, um, especially with some of the changes that came out this week. So. You know, they want information, um, but most of all, it's just easy because there's a lack of awareness and there's a lack of good practices, right? So how, just just survey, how many of you guys um, can say, you know, either in your home computer or at work, you know for certain that you've got some protections in place to protect against this kind of threat in your environment? So pretty small number, um, you know, and so I'm going to get to prevention a little bit later in this presentation and and I think that's that you know that just in this room kind of speaks to you know we just don't have that many protections in place and on my drive over here from Knoxville this morning I was kind of thinking to myself like man why hasn't Microsoft done something about this you know I mean why do we continue to allow consumers to be um, exposed to something like this why don't we give them better tools to uh, to try to um, to uh, combat threats like this? And I've been to a couple interesting co uh, conferences lately. <clears throat> One was right here in in Nashville. I mean, this is Greater Nashville area, but downtown, the Middle Tennessee uh, Information System Security Association put on puts on a conference every year in September called InfoSec Nashville. And um, this year. Uh, one of the keynotes said, we need to raise accountability of companies uh, around secure software development lifecycle 
around uh, taking care of um, the consumer and this kind of this kind of brought me back to that uh, statement because I think that in a lot of ways um, you know vendors could be doing more to help uh, the consumer that's my little that this is my little rant so I'm gonna move on Throughout, crypt, crypto locker is a threat by many names so here's a list of different variants and clones start off as crypto locker you know like I'm talking about September 13 went into this whole F family, which included CryptoWall, Torrent Locker, Crypto Defense, Critroni, uh, Reviton, Crowdy, which is, you know, otherwise um, referred to as CryptoWall 3. And, uh, you know, until this, this week, most of my uh, research and study on this and most of what we've seen has been around CryptoWall 3. Um, but this week we saw a new variant come out called Crypto Wall 4. And I'm going to get and talk a little bit about Crypto Wall 4, um, but not very much analysis has been done at all because uh, the first instance was discovered on Tuesday. So, um, you know, this, this threat is changing rapidly and advancing and is continuing to be profitable, continuing to um, mutate and. Um, and I think we're going to see a lot of uh, a lot come out of this in the next couple of years. So, Crowdy Crypto Wall Three encrypts files, displays a ransomware lock screen. Here's a list of antivirus products that you know pick up on this, and uh, most of this detection takes place after the encryption action's been done. So, you know, at that point you're kind of you know uh, SOL. If you don't, if you haven't put some kind of mitigations or protections into place, we're going to come back to that too. So here's a little eye chart. You're asking about millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions here. So 325 million estimated damages from CryptoWall three estimated across the globe. Um, you know, hundreds of command and control URLs, um, a handful of second tier IP addresses. Um, over 400,000 attempted infections and 4,000 different malware samples. So, just looking at looking at this, guys, what what are some of your observations, immediate observations about Crypto Wall Three? Uh, what do, what is what do these stats tell you? A question on the 4,046 malware samples. Does that mean it's polymorphic where it's never unique when it's analyzed? Yeah, so I, I took this to mean uh, that there were 4,000 unique uh, samples of code. So yeah, somewhat, somewhat not, not polymorphic by strict definition in that um, it mutates itself, but that many different versions have been produced, right? And so that was what I got out of this statistic. And then going back into the five IP addresses, to me that tells me there's only a handful of actual physical servers that these go back to, right? Um, even though we've got hundreds of command and control URLs. So I think the number of actors based on the, the analysis I've seen is pretty small. So just, Drone them. Huh? Drone them. <laughs> Drone them, yeah, right? Uh, so what, what is the campaign code identifiers refer to? Right, so the campaign code identifiers refer to um, different phases of, uh, of the actual uh, rollout of Crypto Wall 3. So the, the developers, the authors, um, in their actual, um, initially they were the ones that were sending out, the authors were the ones who were sending this out. Now they're using third parties to send out Crypto Wall, right? And then, so they, and then they, and of course, everybody gets a cut, right, along the way, mm -hmm. because you're part of the, the crypto wall um, infrastructure, program. right? Yeah, the pyramid scheme, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, um, so the campaign code identifiers refer to actual campaigns like Operation, you know, X Y Z, um, and uh, those are different phases of their or campaigns of their attacks that they're they're uh, they're using in their code. 
um, that uh, for Cyber Threat Alliance was able to recover from the actual um, executables and the emails um, that have gone out. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about this as we move through, but I want to keep I want to keep moving along here. So CryptoWall version four. Um, is similar, encrypts file names and uh, the type. So what I mean by that, and this may be a little bit hard to see for some of you guys in the back, but uh, right here, uh, so the file name is turned to gibberish, right? Well, say, say you, uh, you know, you've know you got your key and you wanna just try to recover one file. They've also taken another step further now and encrypted the file name. So has anyone ever heard of a 2AECN file? Not me. <laughs> so well, they just, they just make it harder for they've victims. gone and yeah, obfuscated the actual file types as well by so, encrypting. And the, the purpose is to make the, the, the files more difficult for victims to actually know what's yeah. been lost, right? Right. Well, all right. So um, the, the purpose based on, um, you know, the guys who are doing the boots on the ground analysis uh, of this stuff has been, uh, you know, from their observations, been determined to be just to frustrate the user. So there's this part right here, but then there's also this part down here at the bottom where, you know, the encrypting of the file types, then down here at the bottom too. You become a part of large of, of large community crypto wall. Yes. So, that, so the arrogance and the taunting that's coming across in this most recent version has just been kind of uh, attributed to, we just want to frustrate these people as much as possible, right? So, total jerk move. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I hear that community has their own members only jackets. <laughs> members only jackets, right? Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here's some other trends. Um, ransomware is, you know, now using remote desktop to spread itself, uh, RDP protocol, um, XMPP for communication, uh, Tor switchers to, you know, hide um, Tor exit node IP addresses, uh, sandbox awareness, browser variant variants, mobile variants. So uh, have you guys heard of browser locker um, is out there now? There's a mobile locker that's out there now. And so it's just some different trends that are seeing, yeah. Aaron, you're scaring me to death. How does, <laughs> uh, how does ransomware use remote desktop? Please tell me. All right, so um, I, don't have, I, don't, we, I don't have too, too much time to talk about that. There's, um, in my slides, there's a link. This is actually a link right here, so you can go and read all about it. Um, it's uh, off of SC Magazine. Uh, you can probably Google for it if you want to. Um, but basically, um, the ransomware is looking for open RDP um, connections, attempting, you know, uh, default vendor hardware, username and passwords, okay. trying to, you know, act somewhat like a worm, right, and yeah. proliferate itself. And we'll talk a little bit more some of the aggressive behaviors that crypto uh, locker, crypto wall exhibits too. So, how do you get it? You know, that we kind of talked a little bit about that earlier, but phishing is obviously the number one vector. Uh, followed by exploit kits and then 2% uh, being other. These phishing uh, emails, they usually come across as a .zip or .exe um, or a, a screensaver file that's disguised as a PDF or a doc file. So, um, you know, how many people take resume submissions by email at their company? We don't hire people. Stop. <laughs> Stop doing it. Stop, Stop doing it. Um, because it's really easy for uh, someone to just disguise their uh, their you know their crypto lock, crypto locker exe as something else, and uh, by and far these uh, executables are screensavers that are disguised as a doc or disguised as a PDF, and then what by default in Windows uh, Windows 8 it doesn't show you the file extensions right. So you think you're looking at a file extension, you double click on it, you're running as local admin. Now you, your user profile, every user profile on your desktop has CryptoLocker, and then we'll get, on, we'll get into some more spreading from there. Um, 
Here's kind of a, a little eye chart of what the phishing Eric, email looks like. Yeah, go ahead, Eric. I had one I wanted to add just that for you with CryptoLocker 4. As yeah. new as it is, there is a new vector there. The operators are now taking two popular scams and smashing them together. Uh, we saw yesterday somebody who got into one of the dial-up scams, like, hey, I'm your tech support guy. They got them to the point where they said, well, hey, you need to pay us however much money to, to fix your problem. That's the point where when our, our, our poor, unfortunate corporate user said, no, 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 thank you. So they crypto lockered <laughs> on the spot. Wow. Huh. So they so he didn't respond to the remote desktop support scam. And so how did he crypto locker them? Like what what did they do? They just I don't, delivered I've had the full since I've been working remote. Okay. You know, I just saw what these guys were yeah. on and filed end of the uh, end of business yesterday. So Wow. Yeah, I want to hear more about that when you know more. <laughs> Absolutely. That's crazy. That's so so yeah, oh, and I also heard uh, a couple weeks ago, I read that uh, the crypto locker, or sorry, the remote desktop support scam, how many of you guys are not familiar with that scam? Uh, where they, you know, Windows guys for a while. Oh, I have Windows getting, tech support. Yeah, yeah, um, <laughs> just click this, pay me money to fix your computer, I do nothing for you and take your money. Now, um, um, that's moved over into the Mac space. This, la this month, so uh, Mac users are being targeted um, for that too. Yeah. Um, with the uh, hiding of the last three letters of the extension, is it that they have two extensions, like .pf yes. and .exe, and so yes. it hides the .exe and you think it's a PDF? Yeah, yes. yeah the, the actual file name would be like resume.doc, and then, but the real extension that's not .com shown or .exe. is .scr. Yeah. SCR, yeah. Okay. So yeah, because by default Windows doesn't show you the file types, the if file you turn extensions. On show all file types. Would you, um, I, yes, I yes but I don't know if that's true in Outlook or not. Okay. Uh, I think in Outlook, you have to hover over the file, and then in the lower left-hand corner, it will show you the actual. It'll read the actual file name. But I'm sorry, I have no faith. Could we could turn on extensions. We could put big red signs that say "Don't click here." Yeah. They'll still click here. Yeah, yeah. They're already get into that too. <laughs> Take their mouse away. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. I've got to speed through. Here's here's um here's a little bit about the 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 process. So um, you know um. And even with the malware checking to see if it's virtualized um, and, or if there's security products um, present. So those guys who intentionally mis infected machines with CryptoLocker in the past, how many of those were in a virtualized environment? Like VirtualBox, uh, VMware Player, okay, so just one. So that this might be the part of that, why, um, you know, you you may or may not have been able to infect a virtual machine with CryptoLocker because it, it's sandbox aware. Okay. Sandbox aware, yeah. All right, I gotta keep going, I'm sorry guys. I wanna get you to the um, protection part of this presentation where we're behind, so I apologize. Um, exploit kits like Angular, Magnitude, Neutrino, Rig, um, they're used to uh, develop these malicious scripts and put into malvertisements to put into iframes on websites. Drive-by downloads like this, um, and this comes from Microsoft, you know, so they're 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 aware of what's going on. Um, but you know, an embedded iframe loads another page that redirects. If the exploit succeeds, um, then it downloads the uh, malware, and then the process starts there, right? So sometimes browsing the web can be bad for your health. Um, Happy Clicker Syndrome, otherwise known as Happy Clicker Syndrome. So this this is what I was talking about earlier. This site may be uh, hacked right here. Maybe hacked. Let's check it out. So here's um, here's the the iframe right here with the uh, with the exploit kit code embedded in it, right? So um, Angular the Angular exploit kit was used here to do that to to uh, to insert that. You know, so again, malvertisement's the silent killer, man, because you're just out there, you know, happy clicker, click, 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 crypto locker. Um, and, uh, 
please keep it G-rated. All right. <laughs> uh, so, you know, what's the problem here? It's a complex advertising economy has created this need for, uh, or this, you know, this market for malicious actors to be able to just, um, you know, abuse that, that uh, environment, abuse the system, and get away with it, right? So what do we have to do? Again, to come back to this com corporate accountability, uh, accountability of, ven of vendors and uh, companies by consumers to uh, work together, use partnerships. I mean, how many of you guys are, are Microsoft partners out there, you know, at your, at your job? How many of you guys are, are partners with any kind of vendor at all? So those partnerships can be leveraged to um, say, hey, we want you to address these issues. And so, um, you know, kind of going back to what I was thinking about on my drive over here, one of my, my plans is to, uh, to try to bring that up, you know, the next time uh, we're, we're talking to our Microsoft guys. Hey, what about this? You know, what are you guys doing in this area? So some more some uh, specifics on file system mods. You know, saves itself with a random name uh, based on a hash value uh, that uh, creates an auto start entry in the system to gain foothold that works even in safe mode. Inter interestingly enough, um, and that hacks uh, the exe hijacks the exe extension so they can delete shadow volume copies and that's what's used to um, conduct a system restore in in Windows. So if you create a restore point. And then you want to go back. If you don't have any shadow volume copies, then you go back to nothing, basically. Uh, it, the restore is just going to fail. So um, it downloads the encryption key, encrypts files, and then demands the ransom. So here's a little PCAP that shows the traffic. How many of you guys are PCAP junkies out there? PCAP junkies? I love PCAPs. Um, I wish I had just had time to do PCAPs like all day long. <laughs> But uh, I don't. <laughs> so, um, but here's a little bit in the traffic, um, and we can see that uh, you know the very first thing that it does is check what's my public IP address, right? And so um, that's uh, something that we can alert on, right? Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. But then this traffic that comes through here. Um, is more of uh, the conversation that takes place between the infected client and the server uh, infrastructure. Yes? So you made a point about the first thing it does is checks public IP. So has any encryption happened yet? It, if it hasn't, then you're, you're alluding to the fact that, that we could script some way to stop it, right? The there. answer is at the time it checks for public IP address, no. Okay. Yeah. So it's not encrypted, or it is encrypted. It is not started encrypting yet, so. because it has to um, it has to Do receive a, a confirmation change. from the the PKI server before um, mm -hmm. before. So you know, getting into the keys a little bit. So how many of you guys are familiar with public key infrastructure, um, private public certificates? Okay, sweet, awesome. So normally, in PKI. Um, your private keys are on your client machine, right? And the public keys are up on a server where other people can verify them and verify, you know, what you sent using the private key, right, came from you. Well, in this infrastructure, um, it's reversed. So the private keys are on the command and control server and the public keys are on uh, your client machine. And where that becomes a problem is what you're really paying for is to get your private key for the decryption software, right, from the from the C2 server. So uh, what I'm looking for when I'm I'm looking at this is for the ransomware authors to make a mistake sometime down the road and, and get too generous and send the private key uh, and a mechanism to be able to capture the private key. So. Um, and then to be able to hijack that and try to do the decryption even though they don't authorize it. Is key generation done on the local system or is it done up at the PKI server? Good question. So, uh, let's see, I'm trying to remember here. I don't remember. I have to go back and check. But I believe that it is done on the command and control server because I'm it has to be, if the have... private key 
the key set is generated there because the private key is retained by the, the private key is not transmitted between the client and the server, so it has to be generated on the command control server by process of elimination. And I don't think that was specifically spelled out in the threat uh, alliance report. Um, so, um, but for a really in-depth analysis, this report, um, I'm looking for it real quick. This Cyber Threat Alliance Crypto Wall report right here, uh, it's a 54 page report on Crypto Wall 3. Uh, it's got a lot more detail than what I can cover here. But, um, <clears throat> all right, so how does the infection work? Or how, what, what can we do about this? How, how can we detect it? How can we prevent it? How can we remediate it, right? We, I think we all recognize this is a, a problem um, we need to do something about. You know, for most people, detection starts with the screen. They, they see the splash screen, congratulations, you've been infected by crypto wall. Um, for some, it might be their SIM solution, security information event uh, management. Others uh, might be local files being inaccessible, server files being inaccessible. Um, but it, um, in the SIM solution, um, you know, here's an example from Security Onion, and we talked about earlier about IP check against IP um, address, and um, you know, so this is throwing a Security Onion alert um, against that trigger, um, emerging threat trigger. So, how many of you guys have heard of Security Onion? Okay, so if you haven't heard of it, uh, it's worth checking out. Um, you know and uh, maybe look at implementing it for for uh, you know use case like this. Here's a, here's a screenshot of the screen if you guys haven't seen it before. Um, this is what pops up after the encryption action is done and says, you know, hey, give me, uh, give me $500, you know, or give me, depending on what the value of Bitcoin is, it could be more. $230. Um, yeah. Um, and this number keep, seem, uh, seems to keep going up. You know, first it started with 100, then it was 300, then, uh, then it was 500. Um, and of course it's timed. And there's a threat to destroy the private encryption key if, if you don't pay. And uh, if you don't pay during the first time period and you decide you want to try to pay uh, after that, then the price doubles. Now, there is a little support button you can click on to send them a message. I have sent some <laughs> wonderful messages. <laughs> Very articulate. <laughs> All right, so you know, log management can be used to detect some of this activity, um, and uh, as well as uh, monitoring correlation services. Um, even anomaly detection could be used to detect the malware uh, attempting to con uh, contact the malicious remote host, like the phone home, that phone home contact. Um, we talked about some of those security onion uh, type of alerts there. Here's, this is a list of the local ransom note files. And uh, interestingly enough, these have changed in Crypto Wall version four. So um, it's now like help, help, help your computer files or help your files or something like that, um, which, which is I think another way of trying to throw um, people who have been studying this and trying to figure out how to uh, detect and prevent against it, and but also a way to, I think, taunt the user, another another arrogant and, you know, taunting move against the user. So, uh, you know, we can alert on these uh, files right here, use in like a Windows file screen auto rule, um, and then shut down the system until the network um, is disconnected. And um, that's been successful, that strategy has been successful in some instances because uh, in, in some versions of crypto locker and crypto wall, uh, the machine has to maintain a network connection in order to finish the, the encryption action. And uh, I'm not exactly sure all of the specifics of that, um, but, I've, um, but you can see this source right here for more information on that specifically. Here's some Microsoft recommendations uh, on file servers, like scanning using PowerShell scripts. Any PowerShell junkies out there, PowerShell users? PowerShell seems to be like one of the up and coming languages for uh, Active Directory uh, domain um, you know, administration. Um, I personally am, am pretty intrigued with uh, the way that 
uh, Microsoft is uh, making changes between uh, PowerShell in Windows 8 and uh, Windows 10. Uh, they're putting a lot more protection into place around uh, administrative actions and, and what you can do with PowerShell and Windows 10. And some of that's a result of things like the golden ticket attack um, and, um, and meanie cats. And if you guys haven't, uh, haven't heard of either one of those attacks and you're interested in PowerShell or you're, you're in an Active Directory environment, uh, it's worth a Google, I, I guarantee you. Windows file screen management with an auto rule. And then, um, and these are important because variants of uh, CryptoLocker have gone undetected for up to five days. And so, um, you know, when you're looking at incremental backups and kind of, uh, you know, cascading backups, or uh, sorry, incremental backups, and then you do a full backup, and that crypto locker infection spills over into your full backup, and then your incremental backups roll off, your SOL at that point in time, right? Because you now, now your back, to, your backups are all infected with crypto locker as well. So your your go to for get my files back is um, is is no longer an option. So. Um, scan your file servers because um, you don't want that to happen to you. All right, so here's some what I call old school security methods um, for prevention. And these are the reason I put uh, I, I, the slide originally. I had it said what won't protect you old school security, and and what I meant by that was it won't protect you completely, right? Because uh, each one of these things on here has a limited use case. So not running as local admin provides some protection, but only for others' data, because CryptoLocker looks for any file path it can write to. Physical file path, network, map network drive, any UNC path you've ever connected to that's still in registry, and that scope is expanding now. Um, like we talked about remote desktop connections, um, XMPP, and then there's some speculation about crypto lock or uh, crypto wall four um, becoming even more aggressive than that and trying to um, spread in some other ways too. So, without getting into too much about that, um, running as local admin does limit the scope, or running as local admin increases the scope of the infection, so you can end up, you know, infecting other local user files. User, user account controls uh, that doesn't apply to app data, which is where the CryptoLocker executable runs from. So um, you know, that, that only provides limited protection. We'll get back to app data in a little bit. Um, and antivirus does provide some protection. So we talked about antivirus a little bit earlier, picking up after the, the infection has taken foot. Some antivirus is now using what's called domain uh, generation algorithms or DGA to um, detect uh, DNS queries against uh, generated domain names, right? So uh, it, it's picking up and saying, okay, hey, this web query, query is not something a user would type into a browser. And then blocking that content initially until um, you know, like in, in a quarantine, typical antivirus quarantine um, um, fashion. So, and that's shown to be effective as an early mit uh, mitigation method. Here's some more um, prevention uh, recommendations from Microsoft. So there's some general stuff over on the right here on security practices and then more specific stuff on the left. The stuff on the right here is kind of like the thing that you've heard your security guys, you know, uh, preach for years, you know, like user awareness training, least user privilege, um, you know, patching, um, and under, you know, using firewall, understanding how malware works, things like that. But on the left, you know, um, Microsoft is saying don't pay the ransom, which is interesting because two weeks ago the FBI came out and said just pay the ransom. Because we don't really, uh, because it's really effective, and we uh, we don't feel like uh, you have a, a good uh, bet at getting your data back any other way. So, so we do negotiate with for, terrorists. Yeah, so we do negotiate <laughs> with terrorists. Apparently. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. More like what is their cut? We had a question. I heard someone say a question. No. All right. So um, so. 
don't fund terrorism, don't pay the ransom, uh, fight the man. <laughs> um, particularly, uh, you know, regular offline backups and restore points are the way to go. Um, and always, always, always re-image or rebuild from, uh, from scratch. Uh, reinstall, f format the drive, reinstall, rebuild from a gold image. And well, I'll talk about what happens if you don't um, a little bit later. But um, running antivirus, using Microsoft Active Protection Service if you're part of the um, Microsoft Threat uh, ecosystem. And then preventing spam um, is you know, also important. DNS uh, reputation web service like OpenDNS. Anybody use OpenDNS here? It's a great service. You need to check it out for home and work. Um, and um, you know, right here in the middle is where I think the most value is. Um, and I'm going to move through this uh, kind of quickly. So if you guys can hold your questions till the end, because we're I'm sorry, but we're really crunched on time. Got about seven minutes. So yeah. So um, right here, software restriction policies. Uh, anybody here running software restriction policies in your environment? This is gold, okay? This is like the, um, the barbed wire at the, the fence, um, you know, the first line of defense, I think, against, in my opinion, against this threat. So uh, check out software restriction policies for your AD environment. Uh, you can push it by a GPO, and that stops um, the software from running in-app data and um, you know, works uh, as a first line defense in Active Directory. This, uh, these other two down here, the um, Crypto Prevent and Blade uh, are great for non-Active uh, non, non, uh, Directory environments, so standalone window boxes uh, or your work groups. So check that out. And then you just can't, uh, oh, I can't overstate the value of incremental backups in this situation. So, you know, being able to restore from that. Um, if your Dropbox gets infected, uh, Dropbox saw so many of this, uh, so many of their customers affected by this, they actually put a button into Dropbox that says restore to previous point. Um, because uh, for a long time they didn't publish out that um, they could restore you to a previous point. It makes sense, right? Because your data is in the cloud, it's all on enterprise, of course, enterprise storage, of course, it's backed up. You know, and they can restore you to a previous point, but that wasn't built into the UI. So they went and put that into the UI, and so you wouldn't have to call tech support and say, hey, roll me back to this point in time. You can just click in there and roll back um, and sever your synchronization with your local host to get your files back uh, on your Dropbox. So Dropbox for the win. Um, you can attempt to retrieve your keys from, from these websites like this, like FireEye and Kaspersky. Uh, interestingly enough, last week, uh, two more crypto uh, malware rings were taken down and they put new keys up there. So if you happen to save your encrypted data, you could potentially go upload a file to there and discover that now your key's available and then get your data back. So uh, as a last resort, hang on to your encrypted data on like a, a hard drive, the offline hard drive or something like that. And, and because sometime in the future, the crypto ring may get taken down and then you can get your files back later. But Crypto Locker comes with Black Shades remote access tool. How many of you guys have heard of Black Shades? <coughs> A guy was in the news about three weeks ago. Uh, he's now doing 12 weeks in prison, or 12, not 12 weeks, 12 years in prison for spying on women through their webcams using Black Shades remote access tool. Okay, so he got black shades, he got it, somehow got it on a bunch of these women's uh, computers through like emails or things like that, and he was spying on them through their webcams, and it all came out, and then he got sentenced. So um, black shades is really easy to hide, really hard to remove, and um, CryptoLocker comes with Trojan downloaders and black shades, um, and uh, so Play it, play it safe, get your files off of there, what you can, um, rebuild from gold. That's, that's my recommendation. And you know, again, uh, these slides are, are going out through the, um, through the Freaknik uh, organizer, so if you guys um, you know, need, want to look through these things, um, it'll all be up there. But um, 
Early reaction and instant response is essential. And um, you know, here are some steps that you can take to in early reaction, disconnecting from the network to sever that client server communication, hard shutdown, not your hard drive externally where executables can't be uh, run. Use a write blocker if you're you know paranoid like I am. Um, and then re-image and restore your clean files to that system. Like I mentioned, you can save your files as a last ditch effort if you're not able to decrypt and then you know, like I said, law enforcement officers are taking these rings down all the time, and um, and more and more of these keys become public. So I've got a whole list of resources here for you guys that'll go out with the presentation. Um, and uh, if you guys have questions, I I just want to uh, make a real quick plug for um, anybody from the Knoxville area who's got uh, an interest in security. Um, the East Tennessee chapter of ISSA, check us out. We're on uh, LinkedIn um, and Twitter. And uh, I'll, take, I'll take any questions you guys have now or uh, after. Yeah. Uh, when I was thinking earlier, you were uh, plugging um, OpenDNS, and I'm certainly a huge, huge fan of theirs. Um, do they have anything in place that's um, effective in this to uh, help people? So. Since you asked, TechLinks, uh, we are an open DNS partner and reseller, and that's not why I put open DNS in there. I personally use open DNS at home. I have been since it, since it came out in like 2001. But um, they, open DNS is doing a lot, especially now that they've been acquired by Cisco around threat intelligence. They have a new problem called investigator, um, or uh, investigate which is um, which actually allows you to trace to the um, malware author's infrastructure um, or the attacker's infrastructure their physical um, like uh, whole architecture is re reassembled just from DNS queries so yes open DNS has a ton to offer especially on the the paid premium side of that equation so, um, and if you want more info on that, just I would just check out OpenDNS's website um, about that. I'll come back. Yeah. So you mentioned that um, in a VM environment, you wouldn't really see a complete infection. Um, if the name of the game is data and just encrypting it and holding up the ransom, I administer a bunch of DPSs with a lot of uh, rather important data. Why would they just stop if it's a sandbox unit like a VM? Uh, do you think it actually does anything to a physical hardware layer to where even reformatting a hard drive would prevent reinfection otherwise? That's a good question. Uh, I don't know the answer to that, but I suspect that the authors are smart enough to know whether it's enterprise class virtualization or personal class virtualization. So they probably have a way of detecting that the hypervisor is um, you know, on a it, you know, is is licensed or or unlicensed, but I can't speak authoritatively on that. So I've seen, I don't know the answer to that. I've had it infect in a, in, a, in a just a localized virtual environment. Okay. Uh, some, some How long ago was that? Six months, nine months ago. Six months, six to nine months ago. Okay. Speaking to the previous question, some malware looks at the the drivers, like let's say like in a, in a virtual machine, yeah. it will install open, yeah, like. Uh, yeah. Uh, or guest file. editions if it's open. Or yeah. guest editions. Yeah. They look at the drivers. Not only that, but drive ways. paths. Like if you if you mount a share drive, uh, a host uh, OS share drive uh, on VirtualBox, you'll notice the file path is like v, uh, VX box. It's like slash slash VX box or something like that. So there are other, you know, signature, there's other ways to, you know, based on strings to detect that. Yeah, so my actual question was, yeah. since, um, since this is primarily Windows software, especially in an enterprise environment, do you get much protection from using Linux-based file servers? That quarantine for the... Prote protection uh, from using Linux-based file servers. So no, uh, the, the SMB shares uh, would would still, if they're writable, would still be infectable. Because it's still the because data, but it won't infect the actual file server itself. Right. Okay. It's, it's using the window. So 
So one of the things, one of the mechanisms by which it infects is it uses the Windows encryption service to um, go out and encrypt to those shares. So like even if you're running a hardware encryption drive, it'll still encrypt the files within the, the drive. Layers. So it's like uh, encryption inception. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. So thanks for listening.